The investors have been using Porsche for 1.8 billion euro. The headquarters of the Porsche Sport Cars and private residences of the former company top managers were searched yesterday by the Stuttgart prosecutor's office. The ex-president Wendelin Wiedeking and his assistant and former CFO Holger Harder have been accused of machinations with Volkswagen shares and disclosure of inside information. The ex-president of Porsche is accused of machinations with Volkswagen. The headquarters of the Porsche sports cars and private residences of the former company top managers were searched yesterday by the Stuttgart's prosecutor's office. The Porsche CEO resigns. Outer Pragmat. Selection of used cars. Hey, here's the question. What's the car company beside cars themselves? Haven't you wondered? Well, it has employees, manufacturing, warehouses, counterparties to supplies, logistics, and so on and so forth. But what if I tell you to remember the stock market? The Tesla shares are in the highlight how we had to buy them in 2017 and would be happy till the day we die. There are other shares. Who's in stock exchange? Honda, BMW, Daimler, Toyota, Ford, General Motors, Nissan, Fiat, Chrysler, well, any other large car manufacturer. Well, what do you have in mind by hearing the words stock market? The movie The Wolf of Wall Street, a bunch of guys who try to outvoice each other to pull their profit, constant staring at diagrams and mystical insiders who obtain this secret information. And whoever obtains it could become rich. We like to stare at diagrams and to make some assumptions. I like it very much. And if we see such a stock diagram of some company, what could we tell about it? The company is great and they're doing okay, because those stocks are growing. By the way, these are apples. And if we see such a diagram, then something is obviously not right. This is Magnet from 2014. But what if, what if, I show you a thing like this? Now we have a bunch of questions. What the freaking hell is it? Well, that can be real. And even if it is, that means a fortune was made here by someone and lost by others. And anyway, something interesting happened there. And do you know what is it? That's a diagram of Volkswagen stock value. And this dot is October 2008. And I have something to tell you. Today, we'll find out why there are national acts written for Volkswagen specifically, how influential families control car companies, why Porsche and Volkswagen became rivals at the same point of time, and what Toyota had to do with the might of Porsche, how it could happen that Porsche, being the most profitable car company of the world, has been taken over by Volkswagen ignominiously and who stands behind the most bold and dramatic event on the stock market among all the car companies. The brilliant fraud of the century. How Porsche and Volkswagen fooled the whole world. And we begin with another story. All is fine. Right. Uh, we're pleased with the car. Just minor defects. Uh, we're ready to pay two million. Should we sign? Hey, no, listen, that's no deal. I took the car in for service. There are new pads, new wipers, fresh oil. Well, no, 2.3 is the price. I read it online. But this is... This is a downright standard situation when you buy or sell a used vehicle. The seller hikes the price, overestimating their inputs because they're out of the market context and the buyer doesn't follow and doesn't know the price of the car. Exactly for those situations, Avida has a great tool named Estimated Cost. 
The analytics is deeper. The search on Avida allows you to compare the prices by a lot of criteria. The number of owners, the usage, the number of accidents from Autotaker records, and other things. And after that, the service shows the fair price for the concrete case based on loss and gain. The main thing, it works independently. Even for our specialist from Autopragmat, it's the same professional tool as the Autotech records. The value estimated from Avita can be a good argument while bargaining. For example, being the X3 2017, and if we look on Avita, we can see the mark great price. And as for gain, it had only one owner, and that means you can ask a particular person all the question about condition of the car and its operation, and they will answer you. Because no one drove this car except them. And another gain is that the vehicle is quite young, and this vehicle looks cool enough, and we have only one loss. Mileage is more than 60% of same cars. But this problem isn't horrible, you can freely buy this car. And so, follow the link down below, download the Avita app, and this tip could help you choose your car. And if you want to sell your car, you can come up trumps and estimate its value beforehand. Avita. People decide here. There are no such cars with the display 2017. Guys, what are you discussing here? Avita says 2 million rubles. You can take your deal out, take your pen, and that's all. I will take my carpets. One. Uh, two. That one. Two of them. You can take the one you trampled, give the others. And the pedal. If you just open Google and use keywords Volkswagen stock values 2008, something like that, then you should stumble on several legal cases about the stock market and stock value, manipulation and fraud. And there will be not one case, but several. As for accused, there are these two sweet people. Windelin Wittiking, the head of Porsche in 2008 and 9, and Holger Herter, his assistant and CFO. Hey, wait a minute, died guy. We're talking about Volkswagen. We're the head of Porsche and its uh, CFO. You wanna ask it in the end of this video? Let us dig. Chapter 1 The Golden Boy of Porsche. Well, from the start, the great and legendary Porsche was a consulting agency for design and engineering solutions for vehicle producing that was founded by this guy, Ferdinand Porsche. They just worked with other manufacturers and told them what was better to do. They didn't start to make their own cars right away. We won't dig up Porsche's history, we don't need it today. Perhaps another time, in the documentary about German vehicles, for example. Today we're interested in the 90s, we begin with them. And the 90s were very bad for Porsche. There was a global crisis everywhere, but on top of that, Porsche had some internal crisis. The company felt really bad. Yeah, Porsche was well known by that time. The world knew the producer of those magnificent, legendary, splendid sports cars, and fans thought like that. But the rest of the car world considered Porsche to be an uh, overestimated and constantly breaking piece of steel, it was impossible to drive in. And it was long before some matcha guys fancied buying dead Turbo Cayenne. The farther, the more people were sure the truth wasn't with fans. Fans can be right readily, except for Audi and Quattro fans, they're all right. The simplest way to understand the company's situation in some time period is to look at the sales volume. And as we can see, in 1986 they sold 52,000 of magnificent and legendary cars. And in 1993 they sold only 14,000 magnificent legends. The magnificent and legendary fall. Seven years, the sales volume declined almost fourfold. As if your doodle was 16 centimeters. And then you woke up and found it was 4 centimeters. That hurts. 10 minutes and I've already made an analogy with doodles. I'm on schedule. But by the way, the company left the USA market. The USA had, I remind you, the largest car market at that time, and leaving it was self-defeating for every car company. Especially when we talk about premium segment. And of course, Porsche was close to being bankrupt. The financial accounting was bad, the company was inefficient inside, and their vehicles really were breaking and very expensive junk. 
Although, as usual, the company wrote it off for the crisis, the American economic plunge, the growth of popularity of damn Japanese cars, and so on and so forth. The management was perfect, of course. And right in this brilliant and joyful moment, they made Whitey King the head of the company. And this man had been working as production director. The task was clear, but God knows how accomplishable to save the company from collapse. Before taking the post, Whitey King insisted on one certain contact clause. He would get 1% of Porsche's yearly income, if it would exist. And in 1993, the company was losing $150 million a year. And very few believe the independence of Porsche could be saved. And so they could approve absolutely any terms. Such great sum a year means 2.8 million a week, almost 500,000 every day. Almost 30 million rubles today. I know I can compare such things, but it's just so that you could understand the scale of the S over Porsche. And of course, during such a party, everyone could insist on 1% in their contract if the company were successfully saved. Not everyone could save the company. One of the first Vindelin's decisions on the post was inviting the experts from Shinjitsu Consulting. While the world was mumbling the Japanese were narrow white faggots, Vindelin just decided to adapt their technologies. Winding machines with used ladies, underwear are great. Everything starts working better if you add some panties to it. And if you bring hentai to the production line, ooh. Such a book is written. The Toyota way. It's not hentai, don't worry. 14 Management Principles from the World's Greatest Manufacturer by Jeffrey Liker. The book describes the TPS, the Toyota Production System, how it's working by them. If you're a manufacturer or a manager, I highly recommend to read it. It's boring for an average person, but very interesting for focused specialists. It's from my home. So, the TPS was invented by this man, Taichi Ona. The system was invented in the 50s and presents the essence of principles of lean management, the Kaizen concept, the Isidoka principles and other rules Toyota implemented in manufacturing. Besides implementing those principles in Toyota, the creators had a mission to promote their system just all across the globe. In a manner of speaking, the official dealers of the TPS Kaizen and lean management were those fellows from the Shinjitsu Consulting. You could order them to come to your factory, they involved in all the processes, they made plans of remaking all and everything, and they helped to bring in those new procedures by their technologists. Winneling did that. And I think he borrowed a couple of Hintai magazines from them, of course. And this is the official side of those dudes. It's fucked up to fall, but strictly speaking, they don't need it at all, because everyone who needs them knows about them anyway. And what doesn't affect the results isn't needed, that's right. And there is a proud Porsche logo in their official cases. After inspecting the Porsche factory, the founder of Shinjitsu, Yoshiki Iwata, mildly speaking, was surprised as a Japanese. Here is his quote. I was appalling. Where is the car factory? I asked myself. It looks like a mover's warehouse. And there were no workers, just apes clumbering up and down shelves instead of them. And there is no racism at all. An Asian guy just said that pure blood Aryans were apes. Then guys buckled up and began to rebuild the company as it was. The process took two years and a shit lot of nerves to teach people to work in a different way. To organize the work with contractors and suppliers and to remake absolutely every process. Remaking anything is always a drag and it's more complicated than making from the start, especially when the company is large. But distinct changes were not slow in coming. Here we have dried numbers from the original New York Times story about it. Everything becomes clear if you read it. Manufacturing area downsized by 32.8%. 640 square meters turned to 430. Second, the distance cars traveled on assembly line reduced by 73.8%. 416 meters turned to 108. Third, manufacturing flows per week reduced by half. Inventory levels downsized by 81.2%. 8,490 large parts turned to 1,600. Manufacturing time reduced by 40%. 120 hours turned to 72. And number of staff for producing reduced by 31%. Unions, what about it? 
By the way, making people work in a new way was one of the main tasks of Shinjutsu because nobody there wanted to work efficiently. Revenue is lost, we know nothing. Paydays on the 30s, we have gainings, your expenses aren't right, that's all. The middle of the 90s was a time period when Porsche approached the car manufacturing scientifically. Daniel Jones, the professor of the Cardiff Business School, said the same article that the traditional craftsmanship for which Germany became famous was filling and fitting parts so that they fit perfectly to each other. But that was wasted time. The parts should have been made right the first time. So the new craftsmanship is the craftsmanship of thinking up clever ways of making things simpler and easier to assemble. It's the craft of creating an uninterrupted flow of manufacturing. And really the new manufacturing process, implemented with consultants by Toyota Technologies and Windeland's decision, started to bring results very, very quickly. Porsche became a very efficient and precise company that was ready to show the rest of the world how it's done how money should be made. But first, we'll make some money. Hmm. Not okay. Now it's okay. Okay, now it's safe. The right way to write scripts. After this method, he wrote a script in one hour. You should simply... If you watched our video about car security systems carefully, then you remember how difficult the society accepted seat belts. And before they became mandatory, though it was an essential element, people had seen some problems. The same with hygiene, only the lockdown and pandemic convinced people that hygiene is important and it's necessary to wash your hands because some nasty things can be on them. And today we're living in a new digital reality and the same wrecks work with our computers, gadgets and every tech you use so that your data, your money your passwords could stay safe. You should think beforehand. Vast Premium Security is a complex antivirus that will keep you safe and comfortable online. It efficiently flights any kind of malware. The most important is that it proves out with crash tests by independent labs. Don't you think that viruses and Trojans have left somewhere in 2008? There is a lot of various programs and sites that hunt down your data and try to steal your money. There's nothing funny about that. In this case, antivirus is just like a seatbelt. It doesn't bother, but it can save you when it's critical. Also, the antivirus can block phishing and false sites and protect your Wi-Fi connection, your webcam, and most importantly, your passwords and your card numbers saved in your browser. There are ooh, so many things saved in your browsers, guys. You should see that. I saw it, but you didn't. And of course, a vast premium security can run with Windows, with Mac and with Android. And of course, the download link is down below. Wipe your browser history. Chapter 2. Boxster, Cayenne and Money. A hell lot of money. Yeah, of course, producing old models more efficiently, that's good, but it won't let you rule the world. Obviously, Porsche needed new models. At that moment, Porsche's bestseller naturally was the 911. When Windelin took his post, there was 993 body on the line, okay, the fourth generation. Fans consider it to be the worst body of the 911, and I agree this time. Just look at it, it looks as if it's trying to say, please don't hurt me, like the whole Porsche back then. The fun thing was that this was still a car from 1964, yeah, 
It was surely revoked, of course, and with other engines, but the difference between 993 body and the original 901 was the same, like VAS-10 was different from Priora. Oh, what awaits me in Porsche Club after such wars, I don't know. Now we'll have to explain it in chat the meaning of the world trolling. Hmm, I'm excluded. Just no, I don't intend to badmouth the classical 911, they are splendid. I won't argue, I would like to buy dozen. But this magnificence of 1964 was too hard to sell in 1995, they had to finish it. And so, be that as it may, they began to design a perfectly new vehicle, completely, they really wouldn't have to do anything with the former bodies. And they even designed not one particular vehicle, but the whole platform, naturally, with all new principles Porsche got from working with Toyota. The main blasphemous move towards defense was that Vindelin decided to use the 911 platform for a small and cheap roadster. He stepped on the sacredness of the 911, and he stepped on testicles of all the fans. And that devil gave up on the air cooling. Haha, uh -huh, yeah, you got it just right. A 911 from the late 80s and early 90s, but with air cooling, yeah. That wasn't great. Perhaps I can understand. Why giving up the air cooling in favor of fluid coolish was a move against foundations and traditions? Although, when Vindelin became the head, the process of this car's design went on, but of course, with introduction of Toyota's gizmos, Vindelin changed the process and the result very much. You can say that he was the hero of this occasion. In 1996, with how offense, these vehicles are the light. Porsche Boxster with its body, 1986. This was the first newly designed Porsche Roadster since 550 Spider from 1953. It was not so different from the future 911 in 996 body at all. The engine was inside the base, a little different mount, another engine not so large, and a bit of differences in the body. Everything else was the same. These are the same cars by the platform, and even engines that were different in volume and power, they were practically siblings, they were much cheaper in design, rather than being designed singularly. Of course, the flaming butthurt of the fans provided for a couple of white knights in Stuttgart. But no one gave them, fans could experience butthurt in every case, and no one pays any attention to them, of course. Remember BMW fans who saw BMW 5 Series E60 for the first time? And what do they think about it now? The main thing for us, remember the sales diagram since 1986 till 1993. Let's go further. Since 1993 till 96 there was reorganization, but since 1997 new models began to work for the company. In 1997, Porsche sales were almost twice as high as in 1996, and they began to grow very quickly. But there were only two cars in the product line, 911 and Boxster, and there was nothing else. The new 911 was better seller than in former generation, and the Boxster kept up with it with its volume of sales. I repeat, no one gave a damn about opinion of fans, but it wasn't enough, concurrently, Wittgen came to Volkswagen and said he wanted to create a car that could protect the company from uncontrolled jumps of the sports cars market, a car that everyone would always need, an off-roader that would be driving like nothing else in its class, that would be the real Porsche by its behavior. And so that 10 years later some respectable man in pointly shoes could drive it to the market. Volkswagen was asked for help in financing his project and their production assets in Bratislava. In exchange, Volkswagen and Audi got chassis for their cars designed by Porsche. That's a real fact, Porsche did make their chassis like no one else. The Volkswagen estimated figures, thought a bit, said jawohl, and the design was on. By the way, Porsche and Volkswagen was independent from one another and it wasn't necessary at the time to make a car together. Before Volkswagen, Porsche negotiated with Mercedes to participate in the ML production, but they didn't agree at that time. But imagine if Cayenne was also Mercedes, all the Caucasus men could have burst from excitement. The project was led by this guy. Klaus Gerhard Wolpert. More than 300 engineers took part in the design, and all of them were sitting in Porsche headquarters in Weissach. The ideal name for Cayenne designing, Weissach. 
The name of the project was PL71, and as we know today, this is a common platform of Volkswagen Touareg, Audi Q7 and Porsche Cayenne with 9055 body. Cayenne and Touareg have one base, and it's a bit stretched for Audi for three rounds of seats. The production began in 2002, and technically Cayenne appeared on the roads in 2003. And if you say that the fans were surprised to see that the looks of 911 were pulled into wreck, you say nothing. Even I, being in Novgorod in 2003, caught this moment, and one could hear around the globe Porsche fans out somewhere in Germany. What is it, Barrymore? Those are Porsche fans howling on the Mars how hideous the first Cayenne S, sir. Huh. They haven't seen Rolls Royce from David. But, despite the critics descended on Porsche and Vida King personally, Cayenne began to sell. People declared open season for it. Just in a year after the sales started in 2004, their volume would be the same as the sales of 911 and Boxster together. Actually, Vida King released Cayenne in time. Besides that, he wanted to release a sales-stable model, he got into a boom of crossovers and off-roaders in the USA. In the early 21st century, the Americans went nuts for large family cars and brought everything they could find. And then that trend also reached the rest of the world. For clarity, here is the picture of traffic in the 90s, and here is the current traffic. As you can see, there are much more crossovers. And Cayenne was the king of the party and still remains it. Just look at the sales diagram and enjoy. In 2007, Porsche, for the first time, will cross the mark of 100,000 cars sold a year. Yeah, in 2005, there was Cayman, renewed Boxster, new 911 in 997 body, but it doesn't matter. Since 2003, and up till now, the powerhouse of the sales and the main car that brings money to Porsche is Cayenne. For our perspective, we have to understand. Cayenne and Touareg since 2003 are built on Volkswagen factory in Bratislava. In 2005, they put Audi Q7 in there. The line assembly line is organized, so it's not really important what are the options of your vehicle and what material the dashboard would be made of. A leather one like in Cayenne or a usual one like in Touareg, whatever. The prime cost wouldn't really differ. And as at the real core, Touareg and Cayenne are one and the same technically speaking, the prime cost of a single car was practically the same, but the final price for the customer – not. Even now, a new Touareg begins with 4.5 million, give or take, a Cayenne 7.5. They have different engines and specifications, but it doesn't matter, those are in 66% of the price. As expected, the price of a Porsche always comes with the margin of a premium brand, it's hardly a surprise. The main thing was people were ready to pay such a sum. And do you remember the financial state of Porsche when Vidigang came to them? You, my little smart cookies, remember that the company was losing 150 million dollars a year. That was crappy. And right now, let us all look at these United Diagrams of Sales and EBIT rate. EBIT is not what you think right now, that's not a Russian cuss word, don't faint, I'll explain it. Even if you don't understand the term, you can see here that something began to increase by Porsche, and never to get ahead, the sales volume. Very painfully speaking, well, it was Porsche's margin. The EBIT rate means all the earnings before interest and taxes. And investors love that rate inspecting the company's business. Roughly said, it means for our situation that per unit of their products, Porsche began to make more money. And if you look at 2002, where the EBIT rate is approximately 17%, the heads of Aftervos can catch a heart attack right now because it's a very high rate for serial vehicle production. Well, for example, today BMW is one of the most high lucrative world concerns. Its EBIT is 9.5 or 10% a year. Let us speak more clear. In 1993, the amount of business was $1.7 billion, and then dead loss $150 million. As you can see, the EBIT rate was negative. And in 2005, the amount of business was $10.3 billion, and the net profit of the company was $1.9 billion. Well, that's not just a lot of money, 
That's just hell of a lot of money. Another billion of dollars on top. In the middle of the 2000s, Porsche becomes the most profitable car company in the world. No car manufacturer even gained so much with every invested dollar in with one produced vehicle. And of course, such sums of profits made the heads of Porsche get a bit loco. Here is the video where Windelin speaks before the head management of Porsche in a golden cage, symbolizing the chicken with golden necks. By the way, do you remember the line in Windelin's contract with 1% of clean profit? No one cancelled it. In 2005 only, Porsche paid their main employee $20 million. He gained 1.5 million per month. And at the same time, he became the most highly paid top manager in the car industry. As of today, of course, we know people who gain more, but in the 2000s, no one, no one gained so much money in the car industry. But they had to move on. Like Windelin said, greeting the Cayenne, we should think of future. What would happen with the company in 2005, 2010? What will happen next? Yet again, this is my job because the company should grow. If the company doesn't evolve, it won't survive. And I think if you go around in circles, it means the beginning of the end. And yet there was a problem, because every company should see for some years to come and for dozens of years is better. And don't you forget who we're dealing with, because we are dealing with the man who turned in nine years the bankrupt company to the most lucrative company in the car world. They wanted a new leap. They wanted to go to space again. And in 2003, after the Cayenne launch, as if they were cocaine, they had an idea. Why don't we size Volkswagen? Chapter 3 the Colossus and Clay Feet. On the one hand, this idea was insane, but then it was very clear and logical. How so? Like that? But first, let us handle with the clearer thing. Why is this idea completely nuts? Well, not fair to sneak. Comparing companies is enough and you realize everything. Although Porsche was over 999 profitable, there was a small family company that in 2003 or 4 produced 70 or 80,000 vehicles. And Volkswagen was a giant factory and produced millions of cars per year. By the way, about comparisons. Who are you, Mary Fella? What do you want from me? Who beat you? Who the person that beat you, little apple? Me, me. Where's Xiao? Why are you at top of those money? 1x Cortex dash x1 at 2.9 DC plus 3x Cortex A78. <sighs> How much do I need my kidney? Why Safari is a browser? When it's a zebra field? I spent hundreds of hours gathering all the information about those devices in order to get a real bargain. I studied all the characteristics, I compared all the prices, I wasted a lot of time, and then I realized e-catalog has all of it. Abundance of any things leads to necessity to compare them to choose the thing that is most fitting. And if such question arises every day with clothes, what you wear going out, then in case of technologies it's an acute problem. Without any guide, technical education and five years in IT, nothing you can gain. Especially when 1x Cortex dash x1 at 2.9 DC plus 3x, well, you got it. And this could be a real problem. If you didn't hear of e-catalog, e-catalog allows you to choose thousands of goods of many categories that would fit you perfectly. For example, you need a phone with a cool camera. We open e-catalog, choose the section with smartphones and choose them in detailed filter, and that's all. 
You see the selection of phones with the coolest cameras in different price segments. You can choose some other parameters in the filter – firm, presence of scanner, SID, even the thickness of the device. As you receive the right selection, you can comfortably compare all the items with help of a special embedded tool. You might the device, create a table and choose what you like. In the e-catalog there is plenty of interesting tools like dynamics of price, ratings of shops and etc. And a lot of articles, reviews, photos and videos. Click the link down below, open e-catalog and choose the device you want – by budget and functions. Let's get back to a comparison of companies. Now we're gonna dig in financial papers. I like that very much. Here they are, all of them. These are official reports on financial condition, production of VAG Group for shareholders in 2002, 3, 4, 5. Actually, you can read them in sources down below. That's only if you'd like to read something so much, because we'll show you everything important now. Okay. Let's look at the numbers of produced vehicles. And everything is clear. Volkswagen 2002 – 5,023,000 cars. 2003 – 5,020,000 cars. 2004 – The year 2004 – 5,093,000 cars. I remember that by heart. The next year – 5,219,000 produced vehicles. Porsche, with its 70 or 8,000 cars, could be lost in those numbers completely, as in the total profit of the concern. Again, the eyes read, the mind is here, not there, we are smart, don't forget. Let's check not only car sales, but all the income of the concern. And that's what we have here. 2002 – 108 billion euro. 2003 – 118 billion. The next year 126 billion and the next 133 billion euro. That's a shit lot of money. I remind you, in the year 2005 Porsche made 10.3 billion dollars and it was a bit less than 9 billion euro, either by money or actually by the production volume, number of factories and assets Porsche was parlor than Volkswagen. And so this was insane, but only at first sight. You should look more careful. The key is also in net profit. If we read Porsche's financial report, then in their net profit we can actually see 2002 – 565 million euro, then 690 – 779, and 1 billion 393 million euro – the net profit. And Volkswagen 2002 – 2 billion 597 million, the next year 1 billion 3 million euro, then 697 million. In 2005 – 1 billion 120 million euro. Once more if you don't get it, Porsche making a couple of dozen thousands of their niche vehicles in 2004 – 2005 was earning more than the whole giant Volkswagen empire combined together in the same years. Yeah, yeah. And you look at that and think, well, what now, WEG is screwed? Uh-huh. Yes, it is. If you make only 697 million euro when your amount of business is 125 billion, it's just preposterous. Even in 2005 the sum of the net profit was twice as large, but still, with such amount of business, it was just off videozine. All in all, Volkswagen was a huge self-indulgent, inefficient, hulking German Schwein. And because of low financial results and poor relations of Volkswagen with financial community, company stocks were cheap. And all the company was cheap, something like 17 billion dollars. At that time it was 13 billion euro. And that is, strange as it sounds, pocket change. You take it from your pocket and buy it. I like to make a proportion. So you can realize the numbers and everything will be clear. Imagine someone comes to you and says, listen, here is the business. For 1 million rubles, its yearly amount is 10 million 200 thousands and the net profit is 86 thousands. Would you buy it? Who? Hell knows. It's still little net profit for invested 1 million rubles. And if this company has on its balance 
different assets for 10 million rebels and you could get them whole for 1 million and you get access to all financial streams. Should you take it then? Of course you should take it. It's practically free. And so Volkswagen was such a perfect bait for any person who had in their pocket extra 13 billion euro and some people do have them. Fancy. That deal wouldn't bring some profit momentarily, but asset volume plus reorganization could bring some very good dividends in the future. And the most important thing was that many people were ready to buy Volkswagen. Everyone was fading for a right moment to assault. And Porsche couldn't allow such an outcome in any way, because Volkswagen assembly lines produced Porsche's golden mine, Cayenne. And all Volkswagen was a very important partner, and it couldn't be screwed and wasted. And so Porsche had to attack it first. At least they couldn't allow everyone else to grab Volkswagen. And if Porsche would waste the merge of Volkswagen and some concern, then all Porsche's business could have crumbled. Well, who would know what new owner would think and if they would be interested in collaboration with Porsche? From that point of view, the coming at Volkswagen sounded very convincing and rational. Furthermore, we know how much money Porsche did. Plus, Porsche was in good standing with banks in the middle of the 2000s, and they could get an approved credit for that without any problems. And you think right away, you should act. You can't possibly waste that chance. No, you can't. And they began to act. Chapter 4. Vidiking starts to act. Okay, we are now at the time of 2004-2005. Porsche had a lot of money, they had something about 6 billion dollars ready on their accounts, and a plan to take over Volkswagen. Volkswagen, in its turn, was making crazy engineering about Bugatti Veyron and really ignoring their financial standing and the climate of the market. Porsche, in the next three years, would set a simple enough but brilliant scheme. And so that you could understand it, so that the puzzle was complete, I have to read some context right now about exchanges, bonds, shares and so on. Now I recommend you to put away your Instagram, your snacks, your dishwashing and to listen to me carefully as I speak. Because if you understand everything, if you put it together, your brain will have an orgasm. You have to stretch your brains, it will be a bit difficult, but trust me, trust me, you'll have an orgasm. I'm really good with them. And if you miss something, well, any fact at all, you wouldn't be able to comprehend all of it. And so, don't be frigid, listen carefully. We all heard that big companies have shares. Technically, a share is a piece of paper that gives you a right to own a part of company that released them. Roughly said, if a company released a hundred shares and you own one of them, you own one percent of the company. Great, at boy, take your sweet dividends. According to the share type, you can get a part of the whole income as dividend payouts or just be a shareholder and the cost of your share will grow as the company grows itself. Here's the fact you even hardly thought of. The stock exchange, the stock values, blah blah, it's all secondhand. Like in case of cars. The company released a certain amount of bonds, sold them to primary shareholders, a narrow circle of people, typically. And then resales begin with wandering from hand to hand of papers with run. Today here is the fancy world APO. This is the initial public offering of bonds by same company. All the rest operations is just some people reselling papers from hand to hand. Most commonly by initial offer on IPO, the company thinks of some stock value by itself that it wants to gain from their release. Or some agents who help the company with IPO say you can count approximately on such costs, final costs. As it is with vehicles, the company launches a vehicle and says about how much money it wants for it. Accordingly, all the people who agree 
or who's allowed to buy, they buy such a vehicle. With shares, it's just all the same. Well, it's more logical to compare IPO with release of some exclusive vehicles. Not all of us could have access to IPO, and not all of us could buy an exclusive vehicle. You can't just enter from the street and buy it. And next, the cost depends on the secondary market, on the public opinion about the car. If the car is valued by people, it wouldn't recede in time. And some rare or, for example, exclusive cars even grow in price. The stock market is the same story. The value of the company depends not only on financial reports, but on relations and people's trust in a certain company. That's exactly why some companies could be overrated or underrated. The company's stocks are being reselled through the market here and there, and according to the strength of their belief into the company, how they believe in its high potential future, that amount of money they're ready to pay for its shares. That's why Tesla shares cost horrible money. Here I have Tesla's financial reports, and here I prepared. According to all reports, it shouldn't cost so much, but people believe it to have a future, and they're ready to buy each other's shares for five or eight hundred bucks a piece, I don't know. Although, according to all the data, they should cost less. Because of that, some pompous news headline could plummet the stock value. Elon Musk smoked a joint at Joe Rogan's podcast, and everybody was like, oh my god, is he an addict or what? How can he run a company with prognosis, what will happen with it in general, blah blah blah. And at the same day, stock value plummeted. And the value plums because people begin to sell shares hastily because of the mismatch of larger supply with demand, the value falls down. And that's because it's the case, like on the secondary car market, the stock market doesn't have any regulator that could fix the price. The price is regulated by the market. What people believe in some certain mass, that will be the price. What for I'm telling you all of this? That's for. Porsche needed to act smoothly like hell. Well, if some dude sniffed out the real plans of Porsche and made them public, hell if they knew the possible reaction of the market was. Hell if they knew the change of the share values of Wagen Porsche. Hell if they knew what the competitors could have done and so on. And it's unlikely something good would happen to Porsche, rather the opposite. And they had to keep their trap shut. And so they began to act in stages, quietly. They didn't start to buy shares for all their free money, and they did start in stages. The first great announcement of Porsche that they buy the shares of Volkswagen was on September the 25th, 2005, when Porsche announced that they gained 20% of Volkswagen shares for 4.2 billion dollars. And everyone with a huge question in their eyes began to look at Porsche, like, hello? The company announced, I quote, our planned investment in the strategic answer to the risk. We wish in this way to ensure the independence of the Volkswagen Group. And all the market said, what independence of Volkswagen? Hello, you bought one-fifth of the company. But let's translate it into the normal language. There is a special law in Germany called the Volkswagen Law. There is a special paper written exactly for Volkswagen, and it says, that all people or legal bodies that have bought more than 20% of Volkswagen shares have the power of veto. When all the decisions would be made and of course have a seat in the board. So, if you have 20% and one share of Volkswagen, then without your consent, no one can make any single decision, a serious decision about the company. It's a special law in Germany. It was written exactly for Volkswagen. Well, I mean, with their 20% of shares, Porsche completely prevented the case that someone could come and simply have a shit into their Cayenne. That's what they meant when they officially announced their share purchase. So, that's how you should read all the serious announcements of some serious people. It's not our planned investment in the strategic answer to this risk. No, we wish in this way to ensure them blah blah blah. But we make some good money here, and so that no one could mess with us. We buy the right to send the hell anyone on the board who could want to do something against us. Meh. That's the approximate translation. But all the financial community looked at this story with some great suspicion, because no one realized why the heck Porsche bought a piece of hulking and inefficient company. 
It was something wrong here. The explanation of guaranteed independence of Volkswagen wasn't for smart people. There was nothing they could do about it, they just were watching for now. By August 2006, Porsche increased their share for 5% up to 25%, and they began to present the government of Germany for them to cancel the Volkswagen law. At the first sight, that was a strange move, as we just found out, the law guaranteed the safety of Porsche production. But there appeared to be yet another variable. At that moment, European Union already existed, and Eurozone, it's not only about the common currency, but also laws, and the Volkswagen law contradicted one of the laws of European Union about free movement of capital, and precisely, the right of veto belonged to shareholders with 25% and more. And for Volkswagen, there was a special law that guaranteed the same terms with 20% of shares. Why the heck did those preferences exist for a car factory? And here, look carefully, on our scheme, another player appeared. It's the land Lower Saxony, that at that time owned 20.1% of shares of all Volkswagen. Lower Saxony is a German land. Like we have our central district on the northeastern federal district, Lower Saxony is the second land and area of Germany. Only Bavaria is larger. If you remember in the first release of Rolling Our Stories about Volkswagen, I told you that after the war, elite forces captured Volkswagen, tinkered with it for a bit and gave it back to Germany. They gave it to Lower Saxony. At first, the whole Volkswagen belonged to Lower Saxony, but then silently nice and easy banks moved in, private investors took some stocks of shares from it, and the land managed to keep a minimum essential share package in order to protect their interests, so that the factory couldn't be moved anywhere, so that the workplaces were safe, so that the factory paid taxes to the budget, and so on. And for that, so that no one could take Volkswagen from Lower Saxony, there was a special law, before the European Union was gathered, and so the land was the main obstruction on Porsche's way to control over Volkswagen, just because those guys didn't want any dudes with sports cars and cash, they would come, begin to remake all the process, to fire workers, to pay less taxes, or even to move the manufacturer anywhere, no, Lover Sixoni didn't want any of this. As Porsche didn't want a board member that protested against any decisions simply because. That's why they increased their share up to 25% and pressed on the government in any way so that they cancel the law that contradicts the Euro Union laws to knock Lower Saxony from the battlefield. At which point, at all public events, Porsche denied that they were trying to take control over Volkswagen. That's why you should never listen to the officials, especially high-ranking. Everything you need is to follow their actions. And their actions were the same. Porsche gradually increased their share. By November 2006, Porsche already had 29.9% of all the company shares. In early 2007, they had 31%. Here's the rule of the financial market for you. If some fat guy with money where he suddenly appears, or a group of fat guys with money, and they begin to buy shares of some company, then what will happen to the price? Think a bit. I don't want you to just sit and drool before the screen. Come on, use your... Use, 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 well, use my tongue bad, but you use your brains really well. If the share demand becomes higher, the price? Yeah. The price rises, right? Whatever price those shares have, the dudes buy them, because they buy everything, and the diagram rises. By the time Porsche had 30% of all shares, their cost was already twice as high, because Porsche was buying them actively. The financial results of Volkswagen didn't change at that time at all. At that moment, everyone almost realized what the deal were. And that is why that story together with Porsche began involving banks, private players and hedge funds. They also began to buy stocks. Back then, the financial market was split. One half of it believed that Volkswagen shares would grow further, because they trusted Porsche to continue to buy them. This half, represented by banks and hedge funds, were also buying shares nice and easy to sell them after with profit and make some money. And the second half thought shares to be overrated, because fundamentally Volkswagen was inefficient and low margin. 
the Volkswagen law was in force, Porsche was still struggling, and that meant Porsche couldn't take the company under their control, and the moment they stopped buying shares, the price would have fallen. As soon as Porsche would quit that aggressive buying, as soon as that brutal demand for bonds would fall, the price would have fallen it down. Of course, financial magazines released a bunch of articles saying that Volkswagen was overrated and the fall was imminent. The situation was following in 2007. A bit more than the third of shares was in the hands of Porsche. Banks and hedge funds had about the same amount, one-third. 20% was in the lower Saxony, and the rest was out in free circulation. I know this is already difficult, but pay attention. I believe in you. Let us add another variable. Always. It's always the case when people think that some company is overrated and it's condemned to crumble. So-called bears appeared on the market. Those guys make their money of declining in exchange rate. How does it work? I'll tell in simple terms. Let's suppose you have a Yandex share and it costs now something around 1000 rubles. I am so smart, as I believe, I trust the company is overrated and has to fall down soon. Or perhaps I know of some sort of inside scandal or some info that should appear soon and affect asset prices, I don't know. My logic doesn't matter, the important thing is I think that prices have to decline. And the main thing is I want to earn of it. I come to you and say, hey fella, could you lend me your Yandex share? If you need it, you just say so, I'll give it back in a flash. You give me that share, and I sell it immediately for 1000 rubles for its price in the moment, and I wait. On the next day, shares actually lose in value, and now their price is 900 rubles. I buy it back, return it to you, and then I have 100 rubles on the net profit. My debts to you are closed, no one owes anyone anything, I have money, and that's called sort selling or bear speculation or operating for a fall. But it's okay and great if the price would really fall. If suddenly, after I sold this share, it would rise up by 100 rubles and you will demand what I owe you, then I'm in trouble. I can't give you a thousand back because I borrowed a share and I must give the share back. And it costs already a thousand and a hundred and so I have to buy it by the price that it cost and give it back while losing extra hundred. I hope it's clear what I've told you. Huh? Not if it's clear. Good job. And so, those bears, who make their money of declining in exchange of different bonds of shares, wanted to come up to the Volkswagen situation and began quickly to lend shares. As everyone thought that was an ideal case, that was 2008. Unprecedented financial crisis. A giant economic ass. Super! Perfect timing. Everyone thought they would make money off the fall. Every financial magazine printed articles that Volkswagen shares should crumble soon. The excitement of buying a Volkswagen share short was enormous. By October 2008, total 12.8% of all the Volkswagen shares were involved in short sellings. That is, the total of all the debt obligations of the bears before the market was the number of 12.8% of total amount of Volkswagen shares. That's it. The usual ratio of the shares in short sellings before the fall of overrated companies is about 4 or 5%. Everyone was just waiting that Volkswagen shares would plummet soon. And now here we have a climax. The fall was awaited by the market. Banks, hedge funds, private investors, everyone. And as soon as Porsche would make an announcement that they stopped buying all those bonds and shares, the price would plummet down at once. And Porsche called a press conference and, seeing the widened eyes of the public, announced that they already own 42.6% of the whole number of Volkswagen shares and place options for another 31%. An option isn't really a share. It's like an intent to buy it. And Porsche could effectuate the event and really buy those shares when they went on sale, or they couldn't. But placing those options told them all that Porsche had money to do it. 
they wouldn't be allowed to do so without it, and as soon as the necessary amount of shares appeared, they would take it at once. And that was the first press conference when Porsche officially announced that they intended to gain the whole power over Volkswagen. And there were no reasons not to trust Porsche, because everything they did before that was just buying those shares. And at that moment, absolutely everyone who was selling short began to soap ropes, load guns and seek the schedule of arriving trains. I'll explain why. Here is what the situation was all about. Porsche owned 42.6% of shares and they planned to buy another 31.5%. Lower Saxonia had 20, a bit more. It turned out that if Porsche made its options, then in free circulation there would be 6% of shares. And short sellers had debts for 13%. Shares wouldn't be enough for everyone. And of course, neither Porsche nor Lower Saxonia wouldn't sell their shares and the short sellers had a very large part of those borrowed shares that they lent from Porsche. And now pay attention. Porsche were happy to lend shares to short sellers. They were aware they controlled the situation. Turned out the part of short sellers really borrowed shares from Porsche, sold them on the market also to Porsche, because they were buying everything. Those shares didn't move, not really, but the short seller now had a debt obligation before Porsche. And now those guys had to repay that debt and buy the shares to return them to Porsche. And they could buy them from Porsche because there weren't enough shares in free circulation. And that meant that Porsche could change any cost for the shares, demand to return their debts, and short sellers had to buy them. And as soon as everyone got it, there was hysteria. Everybody ran to buy some shares as soon as possible. The loss didn't matter, the most important thing was to clean the debt. And as the shares were physically not enough, the price went into space. On the first day after Porsche's announcement about their intention to take over Volkswagen, $200 per share turned to 5. The next day, the value rose to $1,000 for one share. At that moment, Volkswagen, for one day, became the most expensive company of the world being ahead of ExxonMobil that cost $343 billion, Volkswagen at their peak cost $370 billion. In one day, the stock value and the company cost jumped to 82%. But the assembly line was working as before and nothing changed from the point of production process. Workers didn't suspect that their neighbors, financial experts, were jumping out of the windows so much for financial markets. During the jump, Porsche threw 5% of shares on the market so that fellas could pay their debt obligations. And they made billions of dollars of that. The shares that had been bought long ago for $100 were now selling for $1,000 per one share. And all that was happening only because of Porsche announced that they were ready to assault Volkswagen. Data isn't precise, but by different estimates, Porsche at that moment gained either 10 or 13 billion dollars. The joint losses of short sellers on that day made tens of billions of dollars. There's a version that the famous expert Adolf Merkel jumped in front of the train that day because he couldn't endure the losses he sustained on that very deal. Fancy this, such a shady move operates on the fringles of the law. In the USA, all heads of the company would be arrested right away for that manipulation of the market. And in Germany, it was legal at that time. And honestly, no one cared if someone was violating anything. It was 2008 and financial markets were in tatters and Porsche were really flush with money. It seemed Porsche were sitting pretty. They pulled a fast one, very boldly, for all the world and the financial community. They could be happy. But in reality, in spite of such profit, Porsche's scheme creaked at the seams. And it was the perfect moment for a counter-strike. The counter-strike of a man who haven't said another word about the takeover for all the time, although many things depend on him. This man was waiting for the right time in shadows in order to attack Porsche. This man had the reputation of a brutal, cold-blooded and powerful leader. This man was the head of Volkswagen, Ferdinand Karl Pich.
Chapter 5 I will remember your name Perhaps hardly anybody could argue that Ferdinand Pich is one of the most strict and demanding leaders that were on top of a car in concern. Even the world brutal could fit the description of this man. But despite that, Ferdinand is a great person of the car world, and I'd like to begin with the list of his accomplishments. Behold. In the Volkswagen concern, Piech began his career in Audi department in 1975 as the head of the Department of Advanced Developments. Audi was an average small brand, despite its colossal accomplishments in the 30s. The name of the brand was Audi Union, and it was one of the leading sport brands of Germany and of the whole world. And by the 70s, it belonged to the flag and released unremarkable cars that were nowhere near being competitors with giants like Mercedes or BMW. Piech was a talented engineer and engineering supremacy was something he relied on, because the case with Audi couldn't have been fixed only by marketing. And under Piech, the decision had been made about implementing the all-wheel drive for passenger models that were called Quattro and the original race car Audi Quattro, its quadruplex engine that destroyed its rivals in the rally that was also Piech's project. This man needed only eight years to make Audi from an invisible brand of a giant concern to the worldwide known star. But, as we realize from the context of this video, just wins in races don't fill the belly. You need right financial and manufacturing policy. What Wittgen did in the 2000s, with common platform for Porsche 911 and Boxster, Piech did with Audi in the 80s. Combining models 80, 90, 100 and 200s with one platform, and by that he reduced expenses for production and design of those models. And he invested additional profit into new technologies of zinc coating of the body, of aerodynamics and other things that made his model only better. For example, the ARA coefficient of frontal resistance on Audi 100 from the year 1982 was the same as the one of second-generation Kia Ceed. Huge square sedans from the 80s and modern hatchbacks from the 10s. 30 years apart, an aerodynamics is the same 36 and in the 80s that was so sky-high for every large sedan of that time. And such Accomplishments made Ferdinand Piech the only man who could be given that monumental huge task to save Volkswagen from bankruptcy. A few chapters ago, we were joking that pff, financial results of VAG in the 2000s were just 1.2 billion euros, such little profits, oh, that sucks. But, as I've always say, you should see numbers in dynamics. If we look at the numbers at the moment when Ferdinand Pieck became the head of Volkswagen in 1933, here is the report. The hair on your ass will bristle. Per year, Volkswagen had been losing a billion euro. Not some 150 million dollars that Porsche lost in the 90s, a billion euro. At the time when Ferdinand took the helm, Vag had three months before going bankrupt. Fancy that, someone comes up to you right now and says, My good sir, good morning, not for you. Okay, here is a big company with some factories and several tens of thousands of workers. They have families. You must keep their workplaces intact. There are unions and mayor of Lower Saxony. Without them, you can't make any decision. But that's okay, you'll handle it later. The main thing is that facility loses a billion euro a year. That's about three million a day. As we speak, the company flushed 100,000 to the toilet. So, this is a thorn in your side. That's it. Handle it. Ah, you have 90 days to complete the task. Well, good luck. I'm going for a beer. Well, I'd shoot myself. Perhaps still during that talk. But yeah, he didn't even lose his hair after all. The only model of government that can turn the situation to another direction very soon and make people work for the result with self-denial is dictatorship, or army ways that differs not so much. Piag became a dictator, a very successful dictator. On the very first day, he fired all inefficient managers and heads of the departments. Also, eight of twelve production sites were just stopped and only the most efficient were left. 
As soon as Ferdinand took his post, he brought to the Volkswagen a very well narrowly known manager, Jose Ignacio Lopez. One of GM top managers who worked with reducing expenses and didn't let GM to sink during the fuel crisis in the 70s. As soon as unions tried to open their mouth to say they didn't agree, Ferdinand closed it with a punch. But to do Pierre justice, he didn't follow the path of mass firing, he reduced work days and salary by 20%, technically he ordered a four-day week. And Pierre wasn't too soft ever. Not one leader of large auto conglomerates fired their management in such amount as Pierre. If someone tried to debate Pierre's decision somehow on a meeting, or said they wouldn't agree with anything, there was only one answer. I will remember your name. It's a quote, no kidding. The main thing is that it worked. Ferdinand Pieck saved Volkswagen from bankruptcy with his iron fist. As soon as the company felt its legs, he continued his war with expenses with much more zeal and his first engineering offsprings within the new strategy were PQ34 and PL45. MQB for Golf for Family like Bora, Beetle, Octavia, TT, A3, Sir Leon, and so on. And Lionel platform for Passat B5, Audi A4, or Skoda Superb. It was Pierre who started the global movement of all car concerns towards the platforms. By the example of VAG, everyone saw it was the future and it worked. After restoring financials, Pierre began to make an empire from this giant company. And he bought absolutely everything he saw. Here's the report of 2002, and here we are Skoda, Bentley, Bugatti, Lamborghini, and before 2012 there were Mann, Scania, and everything else in Volkswagen, and it was Pierre who added all of them to the company. And if you don't know, since 1998 till 2002, VAC produced Rolls Royces. They bought the manufacturing license together with Bentley, and why should we buy one brand instead of two? Why not? BMW bought and manufacturing rights from VAC in 2002 only. In 1994, Ferdinand created a special department, Volkswagen Financial Service. Actually, there's a bank inside the Volkswagen company, and at the moment of that period, in 2008, there are 5,000 people working there. The aggregate amount of assets of his enterprise was 60 billion euro. Veyron, Phaeton, Bentley Continental, those are all Pierre's projects. A2 was also made by Pierre, bitch. And the speed record of the Civic with 490 km per hour also belongs to Pierre's creation, Bugatti Chiron Supersport. By the way, it was recorded on the Volkswagen track in Lower Saxony that was also given to the company under Pierre. By the way, during the designing of the first Veyron, if some engineer didn't make his assigned task in time, so... He was just fired, and that's it. You shouldn't really mess up with this guy. Well, such character was sitting on the other side of the barricade opposite of these two joyful guys. And when this whole fiesta with Porsche and Shears happened, that cruel and strict Volkswagen dictator was sitting quietly as if he didn't notice anything. Well, everyone thought that. For several years, when Porsche tried to gain control over Volkswagen, Pich didn't say any word. But, be as it may, he understood just everything, waiting for the right moment to turn the tables in one move in his favor. The moment appeared in 2008. Chapter 6. Flight Back The thing was that Porsche brought shares on credit. The first tranche in 4.2 billion euro for the first 20% of shares was completed by Porsche by the ready money, and everything else was bought just for borrowed resources. And in 2005, absolutely every bank wished to give credit to Porsche because they were extra profitable, and no one doubted that Porsche would return those money. But by 2008, Porsche's debt in total amounted 11.9 billion dollars. And that was not enough to repay the debt, they had to pay per cents, by the way. And who remembers the twist in 2008 beside the golden age of Emma culture, underground culture, burning September and etc? 
That's right, the global financial crisis. The global banking industry was seriously shaken and several large banks were bankrupt. And all the situations on the capital market ruined Porsche's play very much. No one hurried to give credit to Porsche. On the contrary, everyone wanted the company to return their money the sooner the better. And that year Porsche's sales plummeted by 27% like the rest of the premium sector. That fact didn't add to the stability of the situation. Although we remember that Porsche got some fabulous income after their stocking with bonds. 10 or 13 billion dollars by various estimates. But you must realize that all that income was on paper. In simple words, the income on paper looks like this. You bought a share for $100. It began to cost $200 sometime. On paper, technically, you have income 100. But your cash didn't increase at all. But when you have only one share, you transform it to cash and that's not a problem. Sell it, that's it. What about a thousand shares you have? You can't just sell everything, it's it's no way. As soon as you begin selling, box selling, throwing shares into the market, the price would plummet, and in the end, those shares would cost nothing. And that is why you are sitting pleased with your life on the pile of those shares and nothing you can do with it at all. Plus, in addition to that, Porsche used all their free, ready money and all the resources to buy bonds and to increase their share in Volkswagen. They made their package to be already at 50.8% of the whole amount of back shares. And all these combined made Porsche just bend over backwards. We remember that Porsche was extra profitable before the crisis. Yeah. But they had relatively few free sources, technically, debts and credits amounted to two yearly turnovers of the company. Not net profit, but yearly turnovers, the point being that you have the income from increased assets price only by paper. Shares cost more, yeah, but you can sell them, because your asset price would fall right away. And income taxes from black marketing Porsche gained, and also percents they should pay, it all in cash, and even if the shares could have been sold without the downside, they couldn't do it any way to gain cash, because selling those shares meant throwing away all the results of the merge. They had to pay, but got no money. Sounds like kaput. In total, Porsche owned to 15 banks, and the CFO, Holger Heiter, tried every trick to reorganize their debt and get another loan to cover credit percents and buy some time until the crisis passed. But the banks waited and didn't give consent. It didn't pay for them. They were stalling to squeeze a higher call rate out of Porsche because banks were in total control. And there was no retreat for Porsche. And if one bank only demanded to return the debt right away, Porsche could turn bankrupt. Because they had no money. One day, before the settlement of debts, the panic-striking SFO Holger Heiter managed to convince the banks to give them extra loans. And in doing that, he had to hide the real situation. He constantly diminished Porsche's real debts and overstated Porsche's real income. Yeah, it's illegal. But when the company needed some saving, the SFO had nothing to do but to cheat, yeah. Nevertheless, the loan he managed to get from the banks back then amounted to $11.2 billion that covered Porsche's current problems, yes, but there was a term to return $4.4 billion in half a year. As we can see in the report, Porsche's total revenue during those business years was minus 3.5 billion euro or minus $4.6 billion. In a half a year, it's impossible to find $4.4 .4 billion. The only way to safety Wittiking and hire to so was cancelling of the Volkswagen law and removal of Lower Saxony from the board. If the law was cancelled and Saxony lost the right of veto, then Porsche, as the only shareholder with more than 20%, could have done anything with the company. And Volkswagen had $12 billion on reserve accounts for a rainy day. And Porsche could have done anything with that money and would solve all their problems just like that. But despite the pressure, the government didn't cancel this law. They were just sitting, waiting, watching the situation. The government rejected Porsche's request to financial help to postpone their payments just a little. Technically, Porsche were in a tight corner and at the brink of devastation. Everyone knew that and Porsche's financial reputation was just ruined. There was a lot of articles that Porsche bit more than they could swallow. 
And Pierre had been waiting for that moment. Pierre got up from his imperial chair and began to criticize loudly Wittgen for incapable leadership. He said that Wittgen was responsible, that he just brought Porsche into the hall. And the main thing is that Pierre said that Wittgen should be brought into account. He made the first of such announcements on presentation of the new Volkswagen Polo, and at the same time he said that Porsche would get Volkswagen's money with limits. At that moment Porsche still was the main Volkswagen shareholder, they should have been receiving dividend payout, but Pierre decided to slow them down because it was gainful for him. Plus, he realized that the only way to save Porsche was the ready money from VAG accounts. Without his permission, they wouldn't get it. And when Porsche's board was agonizing and begging banks to give them more money and to postpone payments, Pierre drank his coffee. He participated in those meetings and knew he had all the trump cards in his sleeve. He removed all solution approaches in any way possible to remain the only one who could help. Yes, Holger Herter bought a bit of time and convinced banks to wait a little. But it didn't solve the main problem, because Porsche had no money. Pierre simply waited till Porsche was in the dead end for real, without moves, and he said, OK, you suckers, look here. How it's done. I have a war chest just right here, with my pocket money, just 12 billion euro. You don't have my company's controlling interests, you guys. Mayor of Saxony is my pal, so I don't care what you think and what you really want. Well, okay, what will happen? First, this boy with mustache has to F off and good riddance. His lapdog should be it, right? Here's a billion euro, for starters, just buy yourself some diapers. And I'll handle this with banks. You have no options. You will do what I say, because I'm in charge here. And they ate that. In a while, Pierre gave his personal financial guarantee that he would deal with Porsche's debts and convinced all the banks to have patience, to wait and not to sue them, not to bankrupt the company. That's nothing, you'll survive. And everyone agreed, because Pierre was sitting on a giant bag with money. And you shouldn't disagree with this guy. He'll sprank you. Therefore, after taking a billion euro from Volkswagen, Porsche owed them a debt. In 2009, as directed by Pieck, Wittiking and Heiter were on the retired list. Look how happy they are. And of course, all the world wrote about that. With that act, Pieck showed that even if they were smart enough to save the company from the crisis, getting big was out of their league. Only Daddy had actual balls here. Of course, not everyone in the Volkswagen board supported the decision to give money to Porsche. But try to say Pierre in the face that you don't agree with him. You will right away. But of course, Pierre gave the money not out of godness of his heart. What was he doing during the time after he saved Volkswagen from the crisis? He was buying car brands. And the same destiny awaited Porsche. Porsche's board tried to do something, to squirm out somehow, to fuss with something, but that was it. The hunters' jaws were already closing, and any try to free themselves looked like convulsions. Their depths were so really great that Porsche had only one choice – either to sink down or to give up to WEC. In the fall, 2009, Volkswagen bought Porsche's car business for $11.3 billion together with their debts. The deal was being prepared for a year, and the merging process stretched a bit, but that didn't matter. The main thing was already done. Pieck added Porsche to his empire, although just a year ago Porsche believed that could swallow the giant. Technically, Porsche bit more than they could swallow. And you might think the end of the story. Porsche lost, goodbye. Wittiking's ambitious ideas didn't work and ended up with merch and loss of independence. But do you really think that Sam Heyer was able to do such things with a company upon his own initiative? Don't you forget that Wittiking was a hired employee. Yeah, talented, yeah, well paid, but he wasn't the owner. Wittiking was just an executor, and he didn't hide it ever. In order to do make it so, to play with the powers that be, just being smart and talented isn't enough. You should have some real might and power. 
And there was a man with those might and power. Intentionally, I didn't leave the curtain that was behind Vidalin's back all the time. There was always a man behind Vidiking's back who silently approved all that shady deal. This is the last person in our scheme and he is very needed in order to completely understand what happened. And this person is called Wolfgang. And his full name is Wolfgang Porsche, the grandson of the Ferdinand Porsche. That's the head of the company. And Wolfgang Porsche was well acquainted with Ferdinand. Ferdinand Piech, that is, long before the situation with merger. They were cousins. Chapter 7. Family conflict for billions of dollars. Dr. Wolfgang Porsche, the head of Porsche's supervisory council and the most influential person in the company. And at the same time, he is the son of Ferry Porsche, a founder of Porsche company. And in his turn, he is a son of Ferdinand Porsche. With those simple calculations, we realized that Wolfgang Porsche is Ferdinand's grandson. Ferdinand Porsche had two children. And the first was Ferdinand Anton Ernest Porsche. Do not mistake him for his father, they called him Ferry. And the second of them was a daughter, Louise Porsche. And when she married, she took for her husband's family name, Piech. And Ferdinand Piech is Louis's son, a grandson of Ferdinand Porsche, just like Wolfgang, who really is his cousin. Together they are a family. Porsche and Piech clans are one of the richest and most influential clans in Germany at this time. The Volkswagen Beetle is Ferdinand Porsche's offspring. He gained his rights to design his car. And after the war, when Volkswagen began mass production of cars, paying no regards to the rights of its creator would be not so fair. Because of that, the Porsche family gained license fees from every produced vehicle. Plus, they got exclusive rights for realization of all the cars in Austria. And plus, they were allowed to use Volkswagen machinery for their sports cars Ferry Porsche began to produce. Since the Beetle is the most popular vehicle of our planet, those license fees made the family quite wealthy and influential. There always was a strict rule. Control over the family business had to remain in the family. On the one hand, that was an advantage. Everyone benefited from negotiations with each other and no one would take business away. On the other hand, not all family members were fond of cars. Sometimes in the supervisory council there were doctors, or lawyers or just people really incompetent in a vehicle business. But Wolfgang Porsche and Ferdinand Pierre had a passion for vehicles and the fate was to take the leadership of the company at some time. If not for unions, Porsche and Piech branches were constantly in conflict with each other. But that conflict entered the acute phrase during the third generation. Originally, Wolfgang and Piech both had equal shares in Porsche by right of heritage, 10%. But first everyone thought that Ferdinand Piech would be the head of Porsche because being just a student, he proved himself to be a brilliant engineer. His graduation work in Institute of Technology of Zurich was the engine for F1 race car. And at once, right after his graduation, Ferdinand held the post of the STO in Porsche under his uncle, Ferry Porsche. At that moment, Porsche was a small family company that was not really well known outside Europe. And yeah, the 911 already existed back then and it was being sold in the US, but Porsche was nearly not so famous and praised at some Alfa Romeo, Ferrari or some similar brands. To catch up with competitors, they needed some loud victory or some announcement for all the world so that everyone talk about Porsche. But the family was careful and didn't rush into action. As Piach inherited the helm of the technical department, he often was out of tune with opinions of his family. He took two-thirds of company's budget for designing race cars and launched Porsche 917 project, a race car to participate in Le Mans. By the words of Piech, he wanted to make a gift to his uncle Ferry, who dreamed of winning 24 hours of Le Mans. At that time, Ford, Ferrari and Alfa dominated there. Everyone realized back then that Piech was insane. It was not enough to put all the money to design, but what about time? He had only a few months left. 
By those rules of Le Mans, the possible racer had to deliver a set of 25 vehicles so that you could use 5-liter engines in your cars. But for the unique race cars, there was only a 3-liter engine. In order to manage in time, all the working staff was involved. Not only people from the assembly line, all the company staff in general, secretaries, accountants, managers, everyone went wrenching. Pierre barely managed in time, and he presented to Le Mans Committee 25 race cars. No one looked at them carefully. They couldn't pass any normal inspection by the words of those who assembled them. In some cars, axis pins were from trucks. Because Porsche didn't have normal ones at that time. But anyway, in 1969, Pierre put his race car to race, and at first it all was good. 917s were in two first places after the qualification. But Porsche failed the race itself, because the pilot John Wolf crashed on the first circle and everyone else didn't make it to the finish line. They just broke on their way. By words of Dick Edward, one of those pilots, and I quote, I was quite happy when it broke. Even though I was a leader with six circles margin. By the way, there was just one and a half hour for Edward to finish. There was clean time. He was an unconditional leader. So imagine how scared he was out there when a professional pilot who goes for Le Mans victory for his whole life was happy that his car broke and he finally could end this madness. The thing was, race cars were out of control. They were very fast and uncontrollable. That's why the pilot never knew what his car would do the next moment. And they just flew down the track and prayed. Aerodynamics was the problem, and lack of testing of the vehicles before that very race. After the ride in 1869, engineers noticed after one race that on the vehicle's tail there were no insects, mosquitoes, flies, anything like that. They were only on the face, and that meant that there was no air pressure to the back part of the car. They corrected the errors, worked on the technical part, on safety and aerodynamics by expanding the tail, and in 1970 Porsche raced once more and won almost everything. After 10 rides, the 917 Porsche took second place to Ferrari only in one of them. And in 1971, nobody could even catch up with it. They made a new record of the track on top of all of that. After 20 years of losers in Le Mans, Porsche became an undisputed leader. And the brand gained global fame. The 917 is a legendary car. Some speed records made on these cars survived for decades. Just fancy the characteristics for the year 1970. 800 kilos weight. 12-cylinder opposed engine with 580 HP, air cooling, and maximum speed 360 km per hour. That's a furious shit the world was talking about. But that couldn't save Ferdinand Piech. Although he bought Porsche to win, to global fame, no one liked his reckless dictate among the family. They were happy with wins, yeah. But the perspective to jig to the tune of some crazy engineer for their whole life wasn't so fascinating. It wasn't enough that relations between branches, Porsche Pierre, were always a bit heightened. In 1972, Ferdinand fueled the flame a little bit. By the year 1972, Ferdinand was already married with four kids and perhaps he got bored. He decided to have an affair with Marlene Porsche the wife of his cousin on the Porsche branch, Gerhard Porsche. He believed it was perfect, I've really nothing to lose. I'm not loved by my kin, I can screw with someone there. On the family dinner. Listen, the dude screws your sister. Actually, my sister is your mom. Well, such a family we are. Go making out. In the end, family butthurt was great, a scandal plus some dawdling, and the family council decreed that no one from the Pich branch will participate in the management of the company. And then Porsche took all the 100% of voting shares. The Pich remains with usual shares. I mean, they were like who called executives. You can watch, but you can decide. 
and the demand for Ferdinand that he needed to search for a new job. And Gerhard Porsche, whose wife Pich dragged into his lair, was really brother to Wolfgang Porsche. And of course, that one didn't approve such acts. And it's only natural Wolfgang was among those men who wished the Pich family to have nothing to deal with the company leadership. So in 1973, they finally got it. And Pich was kicked away from Porsche. For some time, Pierre was working as Mercedes consultant designing the five-cylinder diesel engine OM16, and then came to Audi in 1975. What about the further history of Ferdinand's progress in Volkswagen? We know it already. And Wolfgang was a direct opposite to Ferdinand. He wasn't so loud and pushy, he was a calm man with a cunning spark in his eyes. He worked with Porsche all his life, quite calm, growing and developing his business. Of course, he never showed his accomplishments to the public, he never made loud announcements, he doesn't even have his own page in Wikipedia. That's a shame. Officially, throughout all that period of time, Wolfgang didn't have any official post in the company till 2007. He was just hanging around there. But all the employees, starting from workers on assembly lines till head managers, called him the symbol of Porsche. Even the official side of our dealers has this phrase. The same article said he's been just having an impact, not charging, having an impact. And that is Wolfgang's exact pattern. Officially, he entered the Observatory Council in 1978. Although before that, he certainly had some power, at least at the moment when Pich was kicked out. An active manifesting of his impact began in the late 80s already. He was the first of the family who realized that their holding on traditions and foundations was self-defeating and they need to change something. It was the man who was the initiator of Windel and Wittekind's hire, and technically he officially gave the reins of the company to the person out of the family for the first time. Although Wolfgang treated family traditions with due care, it was him who let Wittekind engage specialists from Toyota, who practically tore the old Porsche factory to shreds. Officially, Wolfgang didn't confirm or deny in any ways his participation in Porsche's plan to take over Volkswagen, they obviously simply couldn't make such a big decision without him. And of course, that taking over Volkswagen, child of Pich, meant for him returning to the family, the company of their grandfather, it was the victory of Porsche over Pich. And as a revenge for Pierre screwing cute Marlin, he would screw him and his accomplishments. Yeah, it was something of financial pragmatism, but mainly there were just internal squabbles between the members of one family clan that went too far. But let us return to the factual scenario. We have in one corner of the ring a cruel dictator of an industrial empire. And also, a calm point head who acts quietly but precisely in the other. One of them wants to regain control over the company he'd been kicked out of, the other one wants to expand his company till imperial scale and to prove that Porsche branch were better than Piech. But what do we have in the end? Did Ferdinand Piech win? Porsche stood on the brink of devastation. Volkswagen bought the bleeding company out like many others before. Uh -uh. But the catch was that Porsche wasn't absorbed by VAC. They built an alien Porsche Volkswagen. This is an interesting scheme. I'm not sure if it was an original plan, but if the scheme was born somewhere in 2005 or 4, a genius thought it through. Yeah. Let me explain. Originally, Porsche Company was a designer bureau producing sports cars. And its name was legally Dr. Ing H. C. F. Porsche Aktiengesellschaft. German naming. Or Porsche AG, that's more common. And when Porsche began to buy Volkswagen shares, they created another company, Porsche Automobile Holding SE. And they bought all the shares. And also, Porsche SE owned 100% of Porsche AG. That was the company that specialized in vehicle producing. Roughly said, that scheme resembles GM, that has a separate legal body, just an office with managers and a lot of different manufacturers. The difference was that Porsche did this to themselves inside, and during the crisis that Porsche SE owned a bit more than half of Volkswagen shares and all the shares of Porsche AG. And here was our merge. 
they created just another path through company, Porsche Swishin Holding, that got 100% of the manufacturer Porsche AG, and in its turn, it belonged 100% to Porsche SE, the managing office. When the merge happened, the controlling stake of 50.74% of VAC shares was left by Porsche SE, and Volkswagen got 49.9% of Porsche's vision holding. There was still controlling 100% of Porsche AG. And those shares, 50.1% controlling stake, was left by Porsche SE. That means, technically, the power over both companies is in the hands of the managing company Porsche SE, 400% owned by the family Porsche Piech. And the head of Porsche SE is Wolfgang Porsche. And Ferdinand Piech, till the day he died in 2019, was just a member of the observatory council in his company. He was a simple manager out there. Yeah, Piech has his power over Porsche, almost half of the company was in his hands, but only almost. The controlling stake of Vox shares was under control of the family, and the head of it was Wolfgang Porsche. He was always hiding in shadows. When reorganization of the factory happened, and the development of new models, and financial success, and takeover of Volkswagen on the exchange market, their race of glory and attention were pouring over Windel and Wiedeking. He was called Porsche's golden boy. He was praised over all success and trash in the media during the merger with Volkswagen. He received criminal charges together with his right hand, Holger Heiter, for manipulating the stock market and for fraud by getting bank loans. And Wolfgang, the man who put Windelin on his place, was always standing in shadows and controlling him like a puppeteer controls his puppet. The whole power really rested in his hands. And Windelin's servants' pay 50 million euro proves that fact. Windelin completed his task took all the glory and all these sins, and happily retired afterwards. His place was taken by Ferdinand Piech, who told with Emperor's bravado about his victory and his genius during press conference. And there, among all the people who was always watching, Wolfgang. In silence, with a cunning spark in his eyes, among all the other people, there was that man who really held all the power in his hands. The power over two unbelievable companies. And the grandson of the great Ferdinand Porsche brought it back, as it was always planned. In 1213, the Count determined Holger Heiter guilty in fraud, aimed at taking out a loan in order to buy Volkswagen shares. His fine was 630,000 euro. In 1216, after numerous sittings, the court of Stuttgart exonerated Wittiking and Harter. Other attempts to discipline the managers of Porsche and Volkswagen for manipulating stock markets didn't bring any result. Several thousand bankrupt short sellers who were trading Volkswagen shares still gave their class actions lawsuits. Not one of those cases was served. Script, music, Stasa Safiev. Director Editor Daniel Gutkov. Cinematography Title Design Igor Zorin. Producer Eliza Tsatsurina. Commercial Producer Sergei Semyonov. Lighting, Vitaly Andreev. Graphic Arts, Pavel Anisimov. Sound and Mastering, Voice Dubbing Studio.